Hey everybody, Brian Allred, teaching pastor at New Life Presbyterian Church in Yorktown. Welcome back to our series on learning to love Leviticus. And today we are going to finish our treatment of Leviticus chapter 11, which we began last week. Uh, Eat this, not that. Um, Seemed like an appropriate title for uh, what the Lord is revealing to his people Israel in Leviticus chapter 11. Uh, We've already looked at a couple of things. We looked at the purpose of the food laws uh, last week. Uh, as well as um, some of the reasons for the classification and how that classification unfolds in the chapter. And we ended with this question of so what? What is the lesson of the food laws that we want to take away? And we're going to do this in two parts. We want to look at the lesson of the food laws for Israel in the historical context and then also for us, the church, today. And so let's first look at the lesson of the food laws for Israel. Uh, First of all, something we didn't talk about last week, but is a very important uh, point to consider, and that is that the division between clean and unclean foods corresponds to the division between Israel and the Gentile world. Uh, Remember that Israel is to be a people who is pure and clean, while the Gentile world is impure and unclean, cut off from the presence of the Lord and unable to draw near to him in purity. The Lord, by his grace, has given all of these Uh, rituals in order for the cleansing of Israel that they might draw near to him. We talked about that uh, in the overview of uh, these chapters 11 through 15 on the laws related to purity. Um, And so the, the Israelites are to correspond to the clean foods. In other words, we talked about how clean foods uh, are those that uh, are, are fitting to the creational categories, that they are whole, uh, that they are unmixed, uh, that they correspond to that creational type and order and harmony uh, that we see. And that's to be uh, the way Israel is to live according to um, God's uh, created intention to reflect his image. And that sets them apart from the Gentile nations who do not walk according to God's created purposes for them, but instead walk in rebellion, disorder, and disharmony. Uh, Alan P. Ross uh, says it this way, the dietary laws then were designed to make Israel distinct from the other nations, associating unclean animals with the nations and clean animals with Israel. Again, not necessarily, you know, that that an animal represented Israel, but um, as Israel was uh, only permitted to partake of the clean animals, they were reminded that they themselves were to be a clean people, um, to be whole and to be a people of integrity, uh, to be a people of um, separateness uh, to the Lord and living according to created purposes, something else Ross touches on as well. Uh, Israel was given clean animals that were designated by God in his word because they were to be the ones who were remaining clean. Uh, And Ross then goes on to say this way, Israel had to live in harmony with the Lord's order of creation. Um, and again, this didn't happen, didn't just happen to relate to food. Uh, they were to live in harmony with the Lord's order of creation in all aspects of life. Again, what we're going to see with these purity laws in Leviticus chapters 11 through 15 is it touches on so many different areas of life. It touches on general health and well-being, um, the cleanliness of the home. It touches on the maternity ward. It touches upon the kitchen. It touches upon... Um, um, bodily discharges and sexuality. So it, 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 uh, the Lord's uh, rule over life extends into the bedroom and every area of life. We are to live according to the Lord's pattern that he establishes for us in his kingdom. And we see this in many ways, right? I mean, we're to live, we are to live our weeks out according to the pattern that he establishes. Six days of work, one day of rest. And so uh, our lives are to reflect Um, a life in harmony uh, with God's purposes, with his order in reflecting his kingdom. And so that's one of the things that the the food laws um, were were teaching the Israelites in that historical context. I've already indicated a little bit of how that might relate for us as the church, but a couple of last things here. Just as Israel had to avoid unclean animals, they were to separate from the unclean nations around them. We talked a little bit about that last week. So the food laws helped them achieve this separation pragmatically. It's hard to assimilate to a people and adopt their practices, and most importantly, in the Lord's mind, to adopt their gods um, and their worship practices if you weren't allowed to eat with them. And so the food laws um, provided that um, guardrail or that boundary uh, with the Canaanites. 
Uh, when the national distinction was lifted, note, in the purposes of the church in the New Testament, the dietary laws were abolished. And so everything that we're saying here uh, seems to hold true because once the church went out into the world and the New Testament message that there is no distinction between Jew and Gentile, male, female, slave or free, we are all one in Christ Jesus, those food laws that were to keep God's people distinct from the nations, at least through food laws, uh, were lifted uh, because then um, the Gentiles could be brought in to the church. Now, of course, there's still a distinction to be made between the believers in the church and the unbelievers in the world, but that's no longer specifically a Jew-Gentile distinction, so the food laws were lifted. No Acts 10, when um, Peter gets that vision of the sheep being let down from heaven, is when he enters into Cornelius' house and realizes that the gospel had gone to the Gentiles as well, and the gospel opens up to the Gentiles, and the church includes the Gentiles. Um, Acts chapter 10, very important um, chapter in the development of, um, of redemptive history, and that gospel reaching the Gentiles is that time in which those food laws are rescinded, the food laws as we see them in Leviticus chapter 11. And so um, that confirms everything we've kind of been saying about um, uh, the reason for these food laws and the lesson to be learned by them. Okay, so that's so much for Israel. What about the church? Well, a number of things we could say here. We are still to be a distinct uh, people and holy in all that we do, to be set apart uh, from the Lord. We must be a people living as redeemed from the patterns of the fallen world and in harmony with God's order and kingdom design. And just as it was for Israel, it's still the case that distinctive holiness touches every area of our life. Um, we don't get to claim an area as our own or uh, to function autonomously in any area where the Lord is not king um, and ruler of our lives. And so um, that's still the case. Uh, again, it's not so much that that distinction is Jew-Gentile, uh, but it's a, it's a distinction that's made by faith, uh, that we are a kingdom people uh, belonging to the age to come by the spirit that dwells within our hearts. It's been poured out on us by the resurrected Jesus and and uh, as he lives, we also live in him as partakers of that, the power of the new age. Uh, but that's to be marked out in the way that we live separately. And again, it's not so much defined by food any longer in the kingdom, but it is defined by character. Um, and again, the food laws were all about protecting the character of Israel anyway, right? Not to assimilate into the worship practices of the Canaanites. But now, um, if you think about something like um, the Beatitudes, that we are called to be a people who are poor in spirit, we are called to be a people who mourn over uh, our poverty of spirit and our, our moral bankruptcy before the Lord, uh, and that produces a meekness and a humility in us before the Lord. It creates a hunger and thirst for a righteousness that we don't possess inherently, but that we receive through Christ Jesus. And in hungering and thirsting for righteousness, that sets us apart from the world around us. The world around us doesn't hunger and thirst for the righteousness of Christ the way the Christian does. And of course, uh, that goes on. The Beatitudes go on to talk about the pure in heart. Um, which obviously touches upon ideas of clean and unclean. We have to be a people who are pure of heart. Uh, we are to be peacemakers. Um, we are to endure persecution uh, with rejoicing, uh, clearly setting us apart from the world. Uh, other ways that we're set apart, we are to be a people of love, uh, as defined by 1 Corinthians 13, uh, being patient and kind with others, not boasting, not being rude, uh, not, keeping, not keeping a record of wrongs, not delighting in evil, but rejoicing with the truth. Uh, by this, all people will know that you are my disciples, Jesus said, that you love one another, and that includes loving our enemies, which of course clearly sets us off from the world around us. Uh, Jesus says, if you love those who love you, what, what different are you than anybody else? I mean, everybody loves those who love them, but we are called distinctively to love our enemies. It's a message we frequently forget, um, but in these times, it's very important to remember that, that as God's people, we are to extend love for our enemies, and that's to be motivated by the realization uh, that God has extended love to us while we were still enemies. Christ died for us, according to Romans chapter 5. And so we love our enemies, and we're distinct in, in, in those kinds of ways. And that distinctiveness is to touch every aspect of our life. We are to live in harmony with God's kingdom design. Our families are to, to be different. Um, the way that we think about entertainment, uh, the way that we um, the way that we watch sporting events, uh, the way that um, the way that we study, um, the way that we conduct ourselves uh, sexually, uh, the way that we conduct ourselves in the world of business, all of these are to be distinct among God's people because we are set apart to be holy in all of those ways. And so again, every area of life uh, 
belongs to the Lord. And that, that was true um, and reflected in these food laws that even what we eat uh, in the Old Testament was a matter of submission to the Lord. And that still carries over into the New Testament that, um, that everything we do is to be done uh, in submission to the Lord our King. Uh, a couple last things here. Uh, we are still to be careful, actually, of our table fellowship uh, with others. Um, again, we don't do that uh, by uh, ethnic boundaries any longer as Israel was to do. And again, let me, let me point this out too. Even in the Old Testament, it wasn't primarily um, that the Canaanites were Canaanites, that the Israelites were not supposed to associate the, with them, that they weren't allowed to marry them, that they were supposed to drive them out of the land. Uh, it wasn't because they were Canaanites. It was because they were ungodly. It's because uh, it, it was a religious, spiritual issue of worship, uh, not, a, not an issue of nationality. Um, and so again, it was spiritual then, but it's still spiritual now for us that um, we should be careful of our table fellowship. Paul mentions this in 1 Corinthians 5.11. That's a New Testament passage talking about um, our restrictions of eating uh, with others. Um, but, th but at this point, it's more uh, an issue um, not of, of refusing to associate uh, with unbelievers. Of course, we are called to associate with unbelievers and to, to love them and share the gospel with them. Um, but it's more a reflection of what we read about in 2 Corinthians chapter 6 about being unequally yoked with unbelievers. Uh, to, for a believer to date an unbeliever, for an unbeliever to marry an unbeliever, for a believer to enter into business partnership with an unbeliever. These are the kinds of things to be unequally yoked. Um, and this is what um, is symbolic in table fellowship. Um, again, in ancient times, uh, table fellowship uh, reflected uh, friendship and deep, deeper relationship. And I think we can, we can still kind of underemphasize that today, but uh, even today, shared meals express communion and they facilitate deeper communion. And so we have to be careful uh, about those that we live with, roommates that we have, uh, again, those that we're dating, those that we're marrying, all those kinds of things. And so that's still binding upon us uh, today, a clear application of, of what we're reading about here in Leviticus chapter 11. And then finally, I mean, just to touch directly on what um, Leviticus 11 is touching on, uh, at least on the surface, our eating and drinking is still to be done to the glory of God. Even our eating belongs to the Lord. Gluttony, uh, even though we don't hear a lot about it today, is still a sin. Um, so whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, says Paul in Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31, do all to the glory of God. And so even our eating and our drinking uh, is to be done in submission to the Lord. Uh, we are to steward ourselves well in the things that we eat. Um, but th that does not mean that we go back and continue to follow the precise food laws that we read in Leviticus chapter 11. It's very clear in the New Testament that those food laws have been rescinded, even though the spiritual implications of the separation uh, of, of the Christian from the ideals and the patterns of the world and um, the commitment to live according to God's creational and kingdom purposes is still binding upon us. And that's the main takeaway uh, from Leviticus chapter 11. So hopefully that's helpful. If you have uh, comments or questions, feel free to leave them in the comment section uh, below. And uh, we will move in next week to the next chapter, or at least the next section. We may take a, a bigger chunk of chapters as we move toward the Day of Atonement in chapter 16. Uh, but we have Leviticus chapters 12, 13, 14, and 15 to handle as well as we continue our consideration of the instructions of the purity laws uh, in this book of Leviticus. So hopefully you'll join us then. See you later.